Are you smarter than most of your peers? Do you refuse to get over your emo phase despite being 35? And have you been known to eat wicked wings out of the bin? If you answered yes to all of the above, your spirit animal might just be the Australian raven. Today we'll be discussing the family Corvidae, which includes ravens and crows. Now, to be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to appreciate these birds. Only those of you blessed with the INTJ personality type and the Sigma male grind set will be able to relate to these enigmatic avians. Such an immense intellect they inherit, such colossal craniums they command, that they've earned the nickname Flying Monkeys. Like parking inspectors, ravens have a reputation as harbingers of doom. But unlike the former, they actually provide a service to the community. You are entering the world of the divine tricksters and the stewards of the dead. The Great Southern Land is home to five native corvids, all of whom evolved from a common ancestor. But how do I tell the difference, you may ask? They all look the same. Hey, cool it with the bigotry, mate. To be fair, the differences are subtle. Though there are slight physical differences, the species are more easily differentiated by their unique calls and the location. Each capital city in Australia is dominated by just one species. First up, it's the Australian Raven, found right across Eastern Australia and parts of the West, particularly Sydney, Canberra and Perth. The telltale sign of the Aussie Raven is its large hackle, the proper term for its glorious neck beard. I tip my fedora to you, sir. These ravens have that infamous long call, which has become synonymous with the Australian soundscape. <coughs> It's been described as the dying man's wail. This is also how 90% of Australian people sound. They really are our bird. Then we have the little raven, found in the southeast of the continent, especially in Melbourne and Adelaide. As inhabitants of Melbourne, their call is more concise and cultivated. <coughs> but it's just a facade to hide their bogan roots. The name Little Raven can be deceiving, as they're only one centimetre smaller on average than Aussie Ravens. Although in the Raven world, I'm sure that's like being 5 foot 11. Next up, it's the Forest Raven, the largest of the Australian Corvids. Their Latin name, Corvus Tasmanicus, sounds like a sick name for my Warhammer 40k OC. Forest Ravens reside chiefly in Tasmania, but also parts of Victoria and New South Wales. They sing in more of a baritone compared to their relatives. These beefy lads have been known to mob birds as large as the wedge-tailed eagle. The first of the two crow species is the Teresian crow. They're found in the northern half of Australia, as well as Papua New Guinea, and are a very common sight in Brisbane and Darwin. Teresian crow calls are much more short and sharp. Unlike the vocalizations of most Queenslanders, all corvids make a rattling call like this. This may sound like she's doing her best predator impression, but it generally means they like you. The crow equivalent of purring. And finally, we have the little crow, the smallest and perhaps the most underrated of the bunch. They're native to the hot and dry parts of Central Australia. As the crows of the outback, their call has a country twang, like they've inhaled a banjo. They all possess their trademark black plumage with an iridescent sheen. The defining feature of our birds is the white iris circled by a blue tint. Oh darling, which I just think is gorgeous. You can also tell the difference between ravens and crows by the base of their feathers. White for crows and grey or brown for ravens. You would have to chase them with a hairdryer to find out, which does pose the risk of falling into a swimming pool and electrocuting yourself. Always a real concern. Ravens and crows are proven to have the intelligence of seven-year-old children, making them smarter than the average contestant on maths, though that's not a particularly impressive claim. 
They display a number of unique and interesting behaviors due to this high intelligence. Here are some highlights. Imagine if you will, you're on a bushwalk in a beautiful wilderness area. It's been a grueling trek and it's time for a break. You down your pack to retrieve your last snack, only to find that it's been ransacked. Australian ravens have been documented stalking bushwalkers. They've learnt how to unzip the backpacks and retrieve the delicious muesli bars within. They've also been observed following zoologists. A group of researchers were in the field to monitor the nesting habits of an endangered bird species when they noticed a group of ravens tailing them. These ravens made a note of the nesting sites and came back later to prey on the chicks. In Canberra, a food delivery service called Wing was trialing drone-powered coffee deliveries. How hard is it to walk to a cafe? Especially in Canberra, you could fit the whole city inside a Bunnings. The local ravens who were nesting nearby didn't take kindly to this violation of their airspace and began attacking the drones. Godspeed, you beautiful feathered Luddites. Teresian crows have been filmed removing ticks from wallabies in a heartwarming yet stomach-churning display of mutualism. The wallaby gets a free spa day and the bird gets a free feed. I bet he was really ticked off. The Teresian crow is one of the only animals that can safely eat the poisonous cane toad. They achieve this by rotating the amphibious hellspawn, then eating them from the belly, avoiding the poison glands in the neck. Shadow sparrows are always watching you. Not in a voyeuristic sort of way, but hey, I don't kink shame. If you notice a raven or a crow, it's almost certain that it already saw you a while ago. They pay very close attention to what other animals are doing, particularly us. And much like those of us with crippling social anxiety, they also struggle to make eye contact. Licorice larks will observe the eye movements of other species, because generally it's directed towards the acquisition of food. So naturally, they become visibly uncomfortable when the object of your attention is them. Along with magpies, crows and ravens can recognize human faces. Researchers in the US found that they associate rubber masks with being either friends or foes, depending on the behavior of the wearer. Can we just stop to appreciate dangerous? Plus hat. You might be evil, but you still need to be sun smart. The crows also learnt which mask was not to be trusted from other crows, even though they've never seen that face firsthand. Corvids boast an impressive vocal range thanks to an enhanced larynx. Did you hear that? That was a raven impersonating a kookaburra. On golf courses around the country, the occasional golf ball goes missing without a trace. It turns out that our charcoal chums collect the balls, mistaking them for eggs, before dropping them on someone's roof in hopes of smashing it open. Brimstone buzzards are omnivorous scavengers who utilize a range of food sources. A jackdaw of all trades, if you will. Australian ravens eat more meat than the others. They've been reported killing birds like juvenile galahs and starlings. The forest raven has even been known to prey on the little penguin. Yeah, they had it coming. Most of their meat comes from nature's version of here's one we prepared earlier, carrion. You'll often find ravens on the side of the freeway feasting on carrion, and why not? It's an accelerated abattoir. But a corvid must be cautious. The careening commodore cares not whose carcass it crushes. A balanced diet is key, and it's good to supplement the meat with your five daily fruit and bugs. On the menu are spiders, grasshoppers, caterpillars, and centipedes, the latter of which they decapitate before eating. Yeah, I don't blame them. While ibises and cockies have a reputation as bin bandits, ravens are underappreciated as dumpster desperados. These sooty savants are known to wait around work sites, shopping centers, and schools in the hopes of procuring a half-eaten sausage roll. They've also been seen working cooperatively to pull plastic bin liners out, much to the chagrin of the local council. Corvids have often been blamed by farmers for preying on lambs. I blame Sam Kekovich for radicalizing our ravens. Researchers found that while ravens do occasionally kill lambs, it's rare. They generally eat the stillborn lambs and the afterbirth from sheep, essentially cleaning up the mess. It may sound morbid, but these gothic garbos provide an essential service in the natural world, cleaning up carcasses. Australian corvids form monogamous pairs like many other bird species. 
although occasionally male Aussie ravens will mate with two partners. We should all be so lucky. They build large untidy nests in trees or man-made structures, normally assembled from sticks lined with grass and feathers. These avian Einsteins have been observed pulling the rubber strips out of windscreen wipers and stealing the letters from letterboxes to line their nests. Both parents construct the nest and feed the young, but the incubation of the eggs is done solely by the female. Nests also have to be abandoned every year because get this, they become so caked in feces that they're no longer sanitary. Ravens and crows lay between two to six eggs and after about 20 days, they're ready to hatch. Juveniles are ready to leave the nest 40 days after hatching. Like magpies, they follow their parents around and beg for food to be spewed up into their mouths. At three months old, the youngsters are feeding themselves. Young Aussie corvids don't develop their pearly peepers until they reach maturity, which can be as late as three years. The three major predators for adult ravens and crows are the wedge-tailed eagle, the powerful owl, and you're never going to guess this one, pandas. Nah, it's humans, cheeky little buggers. In indigenous mythology, the raven is a mischievous spirit. The Wawandari people tell a story about a white raven called Wa. He stole fire sticks from the seven sisters who refused to share the secret of fire with him. But in the chaos, a fire stick fell from his grasp, started a bushfire, and he was burnt completely black. Which is where they get their colour. The Noongar people believe that ravens helped guide the spirits of the dead across the western sea to a paradise beyond the horizon. These stories mirror those from other parts of the world. The Morrigan, an ancient Irish goddess of war and death, takes the form of a crow and determines who leaves the battlefield alive. The spies of the god Odin are two ravens who keep him up to date with the hot Viking gossip. White ravens were also the messengers of the Greek god Apollo. In one story, a raven displeases Apollo with bad news, so he scorches the bird black and all of its descendants. A measured response. But does that sound familiar? All over the world, there's a universal mythology surrounding our ominous friends. As you may know, the collective noun for crows is a murder, and for ravens, it's an unkindness. Jeez, who's handling the PR for these birds, Satan? Ravens and crows are not all doom and gloom. They're remarkable birds, cunning, observant, and resourceful. It's a pleasure to witness their antics. They're always up to something. Not to psychoanalyze, but I think perhaps our unease around Corvids might be a projection of our fears. They symbolize the great other, a shadowy reminder that we will inevitably shed our avocado powered life support system. But I think ravens go to show that even in the world of the dead, there's just so much life. 